Welcome back to the Nutra Medical Report. We cover every action. We cover every area. We want to raise issues so that you can ask better questions. That's the tagline. That's the central tagline, or if you want to call it the modus for this program, the Nutra Medical Report, Clay and Iron Show. And when we have experts like Chris Harris, that's his radio name, our nuclear regulatory safety expert, he does an amazing amount of work. We want to thank you, uh, Chris, on the air. Uh, you've done a tremendous amount of work. It's helping to get together a lot of the parts of this ebook that will be coming out very soon. Uh, and a summary of it, I'm going to hopefully get the uh, the bulk of it finished. And, and I think what I'm going to do is do a ebook version one, because obviously there will be further updates where we add more emails, more background research on Fukushima Daiichi. The big pressing problem I want to deal with before we go to Fukushima is your evaluation of the early reports that are coming out on U.S. plants and the seismic safety uh, events analysis. And of course, uh, you put in your your re email back to me the seismic reevaluation reports coming in from the U.S. plants. Uh, I believe they, uh, when the plants believe they are safe from the new criteria for seismic events that discussed previously in your program, in the EPIRI report there is no further action recommended. The EPRI evaluation specified the ground motion response spectra, which utilizes new seismic data. The new GMRFs represents a beyond design basis seismic alternative demand developed by more modern techniques than were used for plant licensing from, say, Calvert Hills, nuclear power plant, etc. So uh, what, what basically you're saying here is newer technology identifying whether or not the plant can actually withstand the new seismic data indicates, and I'll just mention a few of them here to start with, and I want you to add uh, Calvert Hills, North Anna and Beaver Valley too, and Perry uh, and uh, uh, Browns Ferry, uh, Davis, Bessie, etc., uh, Indian Point, Brunswick, these plants basically all had major issues suggesting they were going to have to have a seismic PRA or probability risk assessment done, uh, which means anywhere from you know millions of dollars to oh, God knows how much to bring the plant up to the point where it can, quote, withstand a seismic event that could cause it to lose containment. Uh, that means a good part of our nuclear quote, force of old-style nuclear reactors doesn't cut the mustard this, right now. And it means we could have a Fukushima-like event here in North America from an earthquake, uh, major extreme weather, or tsunami, or all kinds of different things that could cause a problem. Uh, and especially a seismic event, like an earthquake along the Madrid, uh, Diablo Canyon, many other places are seismically active now in America, and there's plants really nearby these plants, because oftentimes that seismic activity is near waterways, and water is where you have nuclear plants. It's kind of a logical connection tree. So tell us more about this, what's going on with these seismic reports, because this tells us, and it was put in by JASCO, the previous director of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, probably one of the reasons why they removed him is because he started this process in motion, and they're trying to see if they can drag it out or obfuscate, confuse it enough that the public doesn't really get the news, because you're not going to get this on the Fox News Network or the Cartoon News Network or the Vomit Network, I call them MSNBC. You're going to hear only on programs like this, Nutri Medical Report, and, of course, I echo it when I do the, as a guest on the Rents Network on Thursday evenings. Um, I was actually on Monday as well talking about some of these issues. But So, Chris, tell us what, what this all means. Okay, Dr. Bill, once again, uh, thank you for allowing me to, uh, to tell it the, the way um, I try to boil it down so that uh, we, we all could uh, make heads or tails out of this. And, and uh, I know that previously I promised to give you a synopsis of all the different uh, uh, new seismic criteria and how it would affect each plant in these reports, and I started doing that, and I gave you links to them, and we did, we did talk about the EPRI, uh, that's the Electric Power Research Institute, evaluation in a previous program, and that they were going to use the new ground motion response spectra, and that's that is abbreviated GMRS, right. as you'd expect, and and to utilize that that new number, or, or it's actually a set of numbers, of ground motion, expected ground motion due to the increased seismicity uh, that we could expect in the future, uh, how it would affect the original design of the plant. And each plant had to go through uh, an iterative process, develop these probably 100-page reports. I mean, I, I've, I've looked through them, but I've been able to decipher them pretty quick. And... Uh, what, what it is is that it turns out that just the smattering of the ones that I've gone through so far all have further work to do. Okay, now the further work means none of them are within this new seismic criteria. 
Pickard's criteria. That means that all of the plants that I've looked at so far, I think there's a half a dozen of them that you've mentioned, uh, exceed that their their uh, the, the GMRS exceeds what they were originally designed for for uh, safe shutdown earthquake, or, and that's an SSE. That's that's what we call it. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, they have some options. You could sharpen the pencils and do some further evaluation. They could utilize another tool called a PRA, which is a probabilistic risk assessment. And, and in fact, if, if it's really out of whack between the new seismic uh, uh, prediction and what they were originally designed for, they have to do a, a PRA. It's not an easy task. It takes a, a team of engineers uh, and folks that are knowledgeable in it. And they basically, they come up with the most probable failure of, of certain equipment that's necessary for uh, maintaining the well, core from nothing, and and a few other things. Not and, and and ultimately, ultimately there would be uh, hardware changes which are extremely extraordinarily right. expensive. Uh, let, let me give a scientific model of what we do because my father was involved with all kinds of instrumentation in these advanced type of plants, and I learned from him uh, also being an occupational doctor and having to do plant walkthroughs. And knowing metallurgy, et cetera, what they need to do is go through every one of these plants and do ultrasound and x-ray of every potentially failure zone. Then they need to put this into a, a supercomputer simulation of these plants and actually make a, a four-dimensional model and then put them through what I call a stress test. Uh, and look at the ground uh, motion based on the data that's actually submitted to them from the expected type of whether it's an upthrust zone or lateral and what kind of motion waveforms and frequencies that they can expect. because. When you do have an earthquake, and it was discovered by Nikola Tesla in this little device in New Jersey, that if you use this earthquake machine, which is a, he could literally slip into his lab coat pocket, if you strap that on a beam of a building, it literally does a pulse, then picks up the harmonic frequencies that make that building vibrate at a specific harmonic frequency. And what his Tesla machine would do is actually pick up that frequency and start putting out a pulse to generate what's called a giant wave. That's why when you have an earthquake, one building will fall down, the building right beside it, it doesn't do hardly anything to it. So you have to create what's called harmonic giant waves in order to destroy a building. Now, why is that important? It's important because if you know the frequency and you can put a computer model together, you could actually say, we're going to get, as an example, failure of strut XYZ holding plant cooling pool water right side at north northeast corner of cooling pool 4, and it's likely to fail at such and such a level of earthquake lateral motion with specific numbers. That's what we need. We need something that generates real numbers based on a computer simulation of the failure zones, and then they need to go back and re-engineer it in the computer model to figure out how they can be above threshold sufficiently to take at least one order of magnitude higher level of earthquake than the one that they have, so you've got a threshold, of a buffer threshold, so that specific strut or area of weakness won't blow. And the computer model should be able to simulate and tell you what's going to blow first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and what are the probabilities at specific energy levels, frequencies, and motion patterns. That's what we need. Now, if they already have some computer models to do that, I'd like to know if they have, number one. And number two, they got to stop kind of just being, you know, having one engineer or another. Remember, it's an art based on science. When it becomes more scientific, it is a computer simulation based on mathematics. And then it becomes much more in the scientific realm rather than just the artsy realm where somebody's a really good engineer and says, well, it's going to fail because this is the weak point in the way this plant is designed. Uh, that's too artful, and it's it, it may not give enough margin to allow for a bigger earthquake that can cause a plant to lose containment, either the cooling pool losing their water, or losing the torus that maintains hydrogen levels around it, or if it's a boiling water reactor like the ones in Fukushima Mark One. So we come back and want to hear your answer on that because this is important. We we have to start kind of thinking out of the box because they designed these plants 40, 50, 60 years ago and uh, they don't have proper seismic analysis. Uh, the nuclear industry needs to be kept honest and that requires good science. Welcome back, and uh, so Chris, <clears throat> let's go through the ana analysis of this, and then let's touch on uh, Fukushima Daiichi, that's the other area, because I think people should realize that uh, we're raising issues here. I talked recently to Dr. William Ray, and he says he and his colleagues actually use our program that we do every Thursday as one of the main reference points to get information about what's going on 
uh, with Fukushima Daiichi and with the nuclear plants here in America because the environmental docs um, you know, are good physicians. They try to deal with allergy, chemical sensitivity, and so on, but they don't have the background in nuclear physics or nuclear toxicology or hazmat. And they really need to have that input to realize the isotope pattern and the specific isotope-related biological effects of bioaccumulation are we're going to, if you want to call it Trump, all the other environmental dangers that the population is put through. In fact, Dr. Ray recently recommended I prepare a lecture. I mean, it's obviously not going to be at the national lecture now, but hopefully it'll be, my ebook will be coming out shortly, and perhaps at one of the other meetings I'll be presenting this, but the doctors need to know about this because they don't have the expertise to understand these issues. And uh, it, that comes right from the ground level engineering that you present. My background in nuclear physics and, and toxicology, research going back over 40 years, and uh, seeing the danger of ignoring these problems. Our government is completely out to lunch. Uh, so let's talk about, uh, number one, let's complete the issue of uh, what's happening with these nuclear seismic assessments and what's going on with Fukushima. Uh, because Fukushima Daiichi, they have a 200,000 gallon tank that's coming there. And of course, the latest on the review of the uh, assessments indicates that uh, uh, we're going to have some major problems in Fukushima. There's a number of, uh, how can I say this? Uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a number of, uh, of heretical things that were done and said at Fukushima. So fill us in on those things too. Okay. Okay, let's, let's go wrap up the discussion of the seismic issues. I just wanted to run down the, uh, the plant sites that uh, I. Uh, already evaluated. Calvercliffs is in southern Maryland. It needs more evaluation because the GMRS, the ground motion the response vector exceeds, is bigger than the originally uh, thought design. Uh, North Anna, well, that's the first one I went to because if, if they said we don't need to do any more evaluation, I would I would have dropped dead because uh, they, they can't lie about that since they already had a, uh, a larger than uh, size, a larger than uh, design basis uh, earthquake. And, of course, they, they said, no, they, they also are going to do a seismic PRA. That's a big, a big job. Beaver Valley is in uh, Pittsburgh, and it's going to need to do some more work, too, and a seismic uh, PRA. And uh, Perry is in Ohio, and so is Davis Bessie. Both of those need, need also uh, a lot more work. Browns Ferry is in uh, Alabama and needs more work. Uh, Brunswick is on the coast. It's over in uh, uh, North Carolina. It needs more work. And Indian Point, I wanted to make sure I got that. Yep, needs more work, too. Some of these need more work in only certain uh, frequencies, which is, as, as you put it before, about Tesla and how the, uh, he made uh, structures vibrate. You're absolutely right. That's why, that's why uh, mm -hmm. you and I resonate, because you pick up things so quickly. Uh, right, yeah. Uh, it's, well, it's basically... Tesla's, most of Tesla's work came from a book called The Frequency of the Orbs. It was translated from the Library of Alexandria that was in the Vatican Library. His father, although he's a Greek Orthodox monk, that's Tesla's father, was uh, able to get Tesla to get access because he was such a genius with mathematics. He could build models in his head and go directly to manufacturing, read on, uh, on the lathes and whatever to build things. So he didn't need to do a kind of like a structural diagram or layout. He actually read down to the millimeter, or if you want to call it back then, it wasn't millimeters, but to the fraction, he could actually build actual models that worked right off the bench. Um, so Tesla's actual, actual knowledge came from ancient documents, went back all the way to the ancient uh, empire of Atlantis. And of course, the falls, there were three falls of Atlantis. The last one occurred when the dwarf star approached uh, uh, Earth. Right now, all these rivers turning red should be a warning sign that we're going to have major superquakes because we have a red dust, which is iron ore dust, that's the, the tail of the red dwarf star they refer to as the destroyer Heraclitus, or uh, uh, some people call it Nibiru, but it isn't a planet, it's a star, it's a red dwarf star. 200 times more powerful magnetic field. Uh, most of the star systems in our galaxy have a red dwarf star, which is only five or six degrees above absolute zero, but they have 200 times the magnetic field, and when they do have a coronal mass ejection, which is folded loops of magnetic flux fields, the power release is many times a little more dangerous, hundreds of times more dangerous than any CME from the sun. Uh, the, uh, they trigger off because of their of uh, these geomagnetic flux fields, they can trigger off superquakes and volcanoes, extremely earth, uh, earth uh, changes, 
But what's happening with the Red Rivers is they're warning us that major superquakes are coming to the planet. That earthquake that happened last week in Japan was another warning sign. And that means if these plants aren't cleaned up, we're going to have Fukushima's everywhere. Um, because we're going to see a lot more volcanic and earthquake activity in extreme weather, because the magnetosphere of the Earth is connected to the plasma uh, extent across the solar system, and this object, even if it's out in the Oort cloud, 0.73 light years out, is pushing hyperelliptical uh, comets into the inner solar system that have never seen the inner solar system. That was evident last year. And uh, how, what that means is with things like Fukushima, if they don't fix up their act there and in here in America, we're going to be hammered with quakes that are going to make a lot of plants lose their control. Yeah. How about if we run down to Fukushima? I'll, yes, I'll let's do it. Let's go through Fukushima line. now. Yes, let's do that. And, and I and I want to thank simplyinfo.org for, for presenting this information in, in a really well laid out format. Uh, Spectral Unit 4. Uh, yes. The inspection shows more, a lot of damage fuel due to, actually due to mostly corrosion so far. They are a little over halfway removed, and the hard stuff is still yet to come. And it's showing that the older fuel in there that uh, was subject to the salt water and, and the, the elements are showing deterioration and signs of it. You got the report. I made sure you got it. Yeah. Next, there's a frozen wall scandal. Along right. Early on, the NRA, which is the Nuclear Regulatory Agency, not the NRA, the Second Amendment group here in the United States, I, this is in Japan, they said, you know, um, we, we, uh, we're we not sure that the frozen the frozen wall is, is adequate or is going to work, and, and TEPCO immediately said, well, that's great, because now we don't have to do anything. We're just going to let it run off into the, into the ocean. You've got yeah, that report. Uh, I thought it was pretty shocking, and thank yeah, you. Yeah, it is very shocking. The first is never been, yeah. it's been using it basically to stop slurry, the non-radioactive near coal-fired plants and so on. Exactly, and and uh, it's it it's a uh, these were leaked documents that uh, formulated mm -hmm. those initial. They didn't want to pay for this uh, right. other. It's it, it, something needed to be done, and uh, right. and and it's very and it's the right thing to do. The question, the question whether that's the right thing to do, and I, was, mm -hmm. I don't think it's the I don't think it's the, uh, the complete answer. Number all right, let's keep going. Um, they are. They come up with an ingenious little robot that changes shape so they can get around the corners and do all kinds of tight squeezes and all that. That's an interesting weed if you want to take a look at it. And, yeah, you got uh, a picture of it too there. Yeah, I did. I made sure made sure you, you got it. And so yeah, that'll we'll we'll be posted too. after the show today, so people can actually yeah. look at these things. Oh, that'd be great. And and so we can go to simplyinfo.org also. Those those folks are they're they're always on top of the on top of the game. And uh, we talk as often as we can. Uh, so uh, basically, they're going to try to locate the melted fuel and to go ahead and to figure out what needs to be done to remove it. And this little this little guy right here, uh, it's uh, cutting edge. So I, I wish it well, and uh, certainly that's that's what what is needed. Of course. Now, what, what, what does it have? Does chips that can withstand the magnetic flux fields because they burn them out. Because the integrated chips can't tolerate unless they're ferromagnetic, uh, and um, you know e even a normal you know even a normal Faraday cage isn't going to cut down the the amount of force that's involved with these flux fields that are like magnetic and electromagnetic dust devils uh, swirling around the plant. It basically screws up every uh, integrated chip. So uh, unless they're using different technology, which is like the uh, the ferromagnetic chip called the IEEE Prom each uh, from Atmel Corporation. I don't see how these little robots are going to survive high radiation areas. Well, my uh, my assessment is that they're disposable. They're going to build a lot of them. Isn't disposable? It funny how you can, you can, well, isn't it funny how we can have uh, rovers on Mars, and this is even harsher an environment than Mars in some respect? And you're right, maybe the chips could get fried by, uh, yeah. by gamma radiation. Yeah, so, they're just getting background X-ray and gamma radiation from space, and it eventually fries the chip. But I'm sure, like Warehouse 13, they've got technology in the back room they don't want people to know about that's completely EMP and radiation resistant. Well, they, well, they find them to break that out. So uh, yeah, one of the ones that I know about that's classified is what's called light optic circuits. Have you ever heard of it? 
Uh, in other words, the chips are based not on electro electrical impulses, but basically, and or not circuits are all basically microcircuits using nanotechnology of light.